So as you can see, I'm the afternoon entertainment for you. I'm sorry <laughs> that I am going to, I'll try and go as quickly as I can. Uh, I know drinks are important. Uh, just bear with me whilst I get this thing going. Um, I took this slide this morning. Um, uh, this is a slide that makes Sabantu Tile not sleep at night. And basically, I took it this morning, it's from um, um, uh, AIS, and this basically shows the shipping passing the South African coastline this morning. Okay. Uh, the green ships are obviously bulk carriers, the red ones are um, uh, tankers, and the little pink ones are Chinese fishing boats. <laughs> But it gives you an indication of the amount of traffic that's actually going past the South African coastline, which is what I'm actually going to talk to you about today. Um, and it's basically ports and places of refuge. So where shit ships are in shit, and they phone me, and I sort out their shit, and I find places where I can put them in South Africa. That's basically in a nutshell. Okay, so I'm going to run through a couple of things, but these are some of the topics I'm going to kind of mention. Uh, the geographical area of South Africa, the weather we suffer, possible places where I put shit chips, uh, the ports of South Africa, the legislation that governs my life, um, the South African Maritime Safety Authority, um, our ports, um, the requirements from SAMHSA and our ports in order to let me bring these ships in, what resources we actually have available, uh, where are we losing those resources, um, and I thought, well, I'll throw in some lovely pictures for you at the end. Um, there are a, a number of places where we can put uh, ships in South Africa, and a lot of these incidents that uh, sort of arise, arise out of some particular problem which occurred actually on board the ship, or by an event that happened whilst the ship was at sea. And um, insurers call those perils, I call that money. Um, and then of course these perils, one of them can just happen on its own, uh, preferably we like them all happening at the same time, uh, usually right after each other, um, and then, of course, all the lawyers rub their hands together. And then I don't get one phone call, I get 12 phone calls saying, please instruct me, please instruct me. Um, so what is the likelihood of one of these things taking place? Um, yes, they happen regularly, and if you don't like what we do, you're actually in the wrong industry. Because I always say to myself, I have the dream job, I work in an amazing industry, and I, not only have I been able to see the world, but I've actually seen parts of South Africa I didn't even know existed. Um, so let's just go through about a few marine casualties here. Um, this was a ship called the BBC China. Uh, not so long ago, her sister ship also ran into trouble. Believe it or not, it was the BBC Shanghai. Uh, I got a phone call from a reporter down in East London saying, we have more nuclear material arriving on our beach. Uh, I've got this great chap down in Cape Town called J.P. Arabonis, and before Samson got excited, I said, J.P., please do a drift report for me. And he did that, and he said, Michael, in 48 hours, you're in business. <laughs> <laughs> and then I told Darren Burgess at Samson, he said, I'm getting you a tug. Um, one may remember this one, the polit uh, politicians loved it because it was on the beach right outside Cape Town, and they could look at it and point, shit, ship. But she was actually a very good ship, it's just that there was an almighty storm in Cape Town that dragged anchor and that landed on the beach, the, the Sealand Express. Uh, one of my favorites, uh, the um, Safamina Gullis, uh, main engine breakdown coming out of East London, uh, ran aground on the breakwater. Um, and that's obviously the initial emergency and on to the next step. Uh, we did this as a full wreck removal using the breakwater in East London. Um, this one doesn't look so bad, it's the Kiparusa. Uh, she ran aground, also the east coast. Seems where most of the ships seem to run into problems. Uh, day three, not so bad, a bit of oil in the water. Day 135. Okay. So if we look at the South African coast. This was a bulk carrier I had the pleasure of landing on in the, um, in the, the later that morning to investigate what happened. Uh, this is a photograph taken from the, from the bridge of the ship. And uh, she was uh, nearly 300 meters long. You can see the, the sea conditions. Uh, I love this one. This is actually the stern wave that hit the ship. 
So the, the, the crew members on duty on the bridge at the time took the photograph. Um, it's one hell of a wall of water. Now, on the east coast of South Africa, you may have seen it, we have a current which moves from north to south, um, um, and of course, we get these very high troughs and lows, especially when you get a cold front system. So you've got the wind blowing up the coast, you've got the current coming down the coast, and we get these big highs and lows. This is exactly what the ship hit. When I interviewed the crew members, this was some of the actual structural damage done to the ship after the wave went right over the bridge. Okay, damaged the masts and antennas. This was inside the ship. I found three Filipino crew members up on the bridge, and they wouldn't go back to their rooms. I said, do you want to put some clothes on? <laughs> um, so the, basically, the water came straight through their portholes, washed them straight out of their beds, and that was the damage done. So you can imagine what a, what a wave like that can actually do to the cargo stowed on board a ship, containers as an example. Okay, so some more pictures of the, of the structural damage. Okay, this is one of my favorite ships, the Sally off Cape Town. Uh, she drank the anchor and she came up onto the coast. I met a nice Turkish owner of the particular ship um, when I arrived in Cape Town to come sort out the problem, dressed in his crocodile skin shoes. And when I told him that his hull and machinery policy had lapsed, and therefore his P&I cover had lapsed, there was a horrified look on his face, except for the man paying the bill, who realized he could run. Um, the Silly One became a major problem for me and, and, and for South Africans because it became an expense for the taxpayer to actually remove the ship. And in fact, they didn't actually move the ship, she broke down. There was a whole lot of operations. And I've got some more pretty pictures to show you, which will bring the whole thing together. But of course, once she grounded, she then flooded, and the further problems arose. So if you look at the South African coast, um, obviously, it's running um, from uh, the Orange River in Namibia uh, up to uh, Mozambique. Uh, sorry, just gone back. That's 2,798 kilometers of coastline. Okay, and it is not the most pleasurable waters to sail in, and it can be very, very difficult. And that is why we've had so many casualties, and I'll drop a slide in later for you to see. So when it comes for ports or places of refuge and we've got all this passing traffic, where is, can we possibly put a ship when she's in trouble? Because remember, every time we do an operation like this, we have social media, okay? We have 27 million actual live reporters on the scene all the time. Shipping has changed. I remember when I did these, um, uh, the ICANN Tanda of uh, Scarborough Beach in Cape Town. I had a chap come up to me, he said, you've got oil, you've got seawater, salt, you've got fertilizer, bomb. We must evacuate the whole town. So as I say, with social media, we've got people reporting all the time. So it's a very important as to how you present the information because the information coming from the public is completely different to the facts. So the places we can actually put the ships, and I've, I've circled them for you, is Saldana Bay, False Bay, and recently, what we've been using a lot is Algoa Bay and Port Elizabeth. The problem with the um, Saldana Bay is obviously the weather. It's exposed from the northwest. But the great thing about it is that you can put deep drafted vessels there. I had a ship off Cape Town not so long ago. I've got a beautiful picture for you. And one of the places we were looking to put the ship for the repair was to put her into Saldana Bay. We've used False Bay. Again, I've got some more pretty pictures for you to show um, how an operation worked in False Bay. But again, we look after the greenies. You know, the great white sharks inside False Bay, protective species, you bring a ship in. Uh, our 27 million reporters are taking photographs, and you drop one bit of oil in the water, you're going to be in trouble. Algoa Bay, um, we've used it recently. Uh, again, the problem is, it's only good shelter from the west, so the weather changes and you get an east coming through, and anybody who's flown into PE will know when you fly into the airport, you start with the wings of the plane automatically start moving left to right. Okay? You've had enough law for today, but I just want to mention a couple of the little important uh, legislation which applies to what we do. And the first one up that stands out is the Marine Traffic Act. That's the act that gives power SAMHSA the power to arrest masters, to charge masters, to imprison people. The rest of the le other legislation is there just for your information, and I believe the presentation will be made available. 
so you can always go back and, and have a look-see later. There's a the Merchant Shipping Act, which applies the National Ports Act in terms of, of, of TMPA, and my favorite little ones that SAMHSA likes sending me in the post, uh, the SAMHSA Marine Notices. And they always refer to the Marine Traffic Act at the end and the penalties that can apply. Okay. So if we look into if, if the most important piece being the Marine Traffic Act, this governs ships that come into the Republic, leave the Republic. And the idea being is that all ships coming into South Africa go into a port and leave from a port. Arrive at an anchorage, for example, Algoa Bay with the bunkering at the moment, arrive, do their bunkering, and leave. Uh, and not on beaches. Okay, so basically the act sets out where ships are meant to go to harbors, and they're often referred to fishing um, villages, um, because it's all included in the, in, in, in the legislation. I mentioned Algoa Bay here because um, that's been used predominantly a lot at the moment. Anybody who lives down there says, Jesus, our port's got busy. It says, no, it's just one big fuel st um, storage operation going on. Um, nobody can do anything in this country, as you know, without permission, and the permission in terms of South African law um, comes from the minister. Here we're referring to the minister of transport, but generally we'll de we deal with Sub uh, Subuntu and, S and SAMHSA. They are our conduit in terms of the Ministry of Transport. Um, the point I, the point I, I put in yellow there is that no person within the territorial waters or internal waters uh, may immobilize or lay up a ship outside a harbour or fishing harbour. So when, for example, the K-Line ship comes to Durban, she arrives and she anchors at the anchorage, that's perfectly legal. That's what she's expected to do. It's when she, for example, is heading down the coast, and I'll leave K-Line out the way and we'll focus on somebody else, uh, a big Chinese operation, and I have a frantic phone call from a friend of mine who lives down uh, um, uh, in Port Alfred. He said, we've been invaded by the Chinese. Oh, well, what do you mean? He said, no, no, there's a landing craft. They are coming. Okay, obviously you live in the Eastern Cape and I don't want to inquire about your life in the Eastern Cape and what you may or may not be smoking. But basically what happened was they decided to immobilize their ship and in order to do what they wanted to do, they had to launch all these uh, barges which were being transported to Europe. And he was convinced uh, uh, they are coming. Okay, so you can't do that. And I had to get hold of the owners and say, excuse me, you can't just mobilize your ship in, in our waters. There are rules in place that you need to follow in order to get past the Buntu. So, again, I'm just highlighting all the, the important yellow bits here. This is what SAMHSA can do. If you're going to mobilize the ship, um, they do call me and say, Michael, we will require security from you. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad we've gone past the stage of how much security we're going to get from you. Uh, SAMHSA way up the risks now, and they've got a great team. Um, and they can tell you, okay, Michael, listen, this is the risk of this going wrong. She may end up on this beach. It's in a, close to Marine Protected Agency. We want X amount of money from you. And all PNI clubs uh, are quite happy um, to put up security in respect of a potential claim. It's not often that PNI clubs like putting up security in respect of a potential claim, because they always like to know how much money might leave their pocket. But in these cases, if somebody sets them they're in for maybe 50 million, whatever the case may be, or rec removal in South Africa is unlimited, PNI clubs will come to the party. Okay, let's get past all this horrible law. Okay, again, simple rules, what ship owners are not allowed to do. You can't just simply drop anchor, do things without um, permission. You can't switch off your main engines, as what happened on the Selly 1. They didn't tell anybody that their main engines had broken down. And of course, when the weather changed, she dragged anchor. They couldn't start their engines, and she ended up on the beach. And again, if you do something wrong under the Act, you will be arrested. So what is SAMHSA? And you, everybody knows it's South African Maritime Safety Authority. Uh, you, their mission statement is obviously looking after maritime safety, health uh, of seafarers, and of course, environmental protection. So they implement and develop our marine environmental protection standards and our safety policies. Um, they also provide technical and operational standards for shipping in South Africa. Uh, they carry out port state inspections on ships, but obviously look after the South African fleet, which hopefully is starting to grow slowly. 
Okay, and then they're also looking at seafarers, they look at standards, so we have the right crew members operating ships, all right? Um, and that's important. I've been on board ships and I look at the crew and I think, how the hell did you get the ship here? And then one day you made a left turn and she's on the beach. I remember speaking to one, one, one duty officer and I said to him, um, sorry, when the white lighthouse was on your left-hand side, yes, uh, the port side, four letters port, four letters left, it was on your left side, yeah, 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 it was there. So when it appeared on your right-hand side, you know, the starboard side, you didn't think the bow had changed direction? No, no. And then he was perpendicular to the beach. Okay, so what is the role of, Sam of SAMHSA? Of course, that's to respond to marine pollution incidents as they happen, uh, and of course, marine emergencies. They also operate MRCC. I'm sure many of you, you may have heard of the phrase MRCC. It's a Maritime Rescue Coordination Center in Cape Town. Um, ships always relay messages to them if there's a problem on board a ship, a crew member may be injured, for example, they contact ML, MRCC and arrangements can be made to get the seafarer off the ship or if there's a problem to fix it. Okay, there are a couple of other little, um, little bits and bobs that SAMHSA does, but again, it'll, it'll appear when, when you get it. The key point here is investigating maritime casualties. So if we do have a maritime casualty, uh, let me pick up one that you may all know, the Smart, for example, she came out of Richards Bay, um, broke her back uh, after damaging. SAMHSA will carry out an investigation into the incident and how it happened. Okay, so SAMHSA also have the authority um, to prevent vessels coming towards the coast um, seeking refuge. Um, notwithstanding this, our ports in South Africa are controlled by um, Transnet, uh, the National Ports Authority, and in South Africa, we do not have a character called SOSREP. Uh, SOSREP is an English um, a position created by the uh, British government to respond to marine emergencies, and basically it's an acronym for the Secretary of State's Special Representative. And that's a topic we can talk about over a drink when you've looked at all the pictures. Okay. And then you get things I mentioned to you, marine notice. These are little things that SAMHSA send out by email. You may not pick them up, but they just kind of appear, and you may gloss over them. Uh, unfortunately, in my life, I never gloss over one thing Subuntu sends me. I look at them closely. I even give them little names when I receive it. I call this one the Darren Burgess marine notice. And basically, how this little notice came about, I suspect after some of my ships misbehaved recently, and um, the notice says it's the ships that are on innocent passages. Now, what's an innocent passage? That's a ship, say, coming from South America. Um, she's off to um, China or she's going to Europe and she's coming through our waters. She's innocently going about her affairs. No problem. But if something happens on board the ship which makes the ship no longer seaworthy, okay, so a big wave comes along, does damage, Okay, that automatically says the ship is now no longer seaworthy, it must be reported to SAMHSA. Or where the ship develops a small little crack, you now I call a small little crack, yeah? Yeah, small little crack in my life, it's a bunch of, it's, it's a crack. Um, this must be reported to SAMHSA immediately, and it goes to MRCC. So basically, I like this word, I picked it up this week, whistleblowers, because that's what we've become. So p and correspondents, lawyers, uh, marine brokers, any ship repairers, insurers, and the owners themselves, of course, if we hear about a problem on board a ship, we've got to tell MRCC. So if a client phones me and says to me, Mike, you say, Greek, hey, Mike, I've got a problem. <laughs> and I go like, okay, how bad's the problem and how can I fix it? Oh, it's always a little problem with Greeks. So it's always a little problem. Uh, the first thing I'm going to say to him, don't tell me the name of the ship. I don't want to know. Because I then have to report to SAMHSA about the particular problem. And of course, as I said to you, we've got 27 million um, roving private reporters in South Africa at the moment. And I had a ship come off Cape Town called the Stella Unicorn. Her sister ship, the Stella Daisy, had unfortunately um, sunk. Uh, 23, um, 21 crew members had lost their lives. And, you were, and of course, uh, 
it was major news. You know, these ships were all running into problems. They were all cracking. They were all sinking. And of course, somebody had heard one was passing Cape Town. Therefore, there was a problem. So before I could get all the information, I'm going to talk to you about it now. Here she comes up. Um, the Stella Unicorn. I had to try and gather information so I can present it, which I'm going to show you. Um, 27 million reporters had already reported, and Sam's already on the phone. Michael, why haven't you told me about this ship yet? Okay, so we're basically what we've become, we've become whistleblowers, and we must report this through to SAMHSA. And, and SAMHSA, in fairness, were right. You know, I, I call this the Darren Burgess little notice, but he was right. Is that there's an obligation on ship owners, if there's a problem, come clean. Tell SAMHSA that there's a problem, phone me, tell me the problem. I can phone SAMHSA immediately, say, I have a ship, she has a kind of a problem, I'm getting the information, they will take a little step back, won't be a large step, a little step back, and then I can provide them what they need, what they need to know. The Equator Peace was a ship um, which had a bit of a problem. They didn't tell me about the problem. When the guy phoned me, I said, and I was in Mozambique at the time, I said to him, where's the crack? And he said to me, how do you know there's a crack? Well, I said, well, she's a Cape size, and she's X number of years old. There'll be a crack, and it's probably between three or four, or four and five. He says, yeah, you're right, it's uh, three, and three and four. Okay, uh, is she fully laden? Yes, fully laden iron ore. Okay, loaded South America? Yes, going to China? Yeah. When I went inside the hold, she had 27 little holes on the side of the ship, peeing in water, and she wanted to close the coast, and she wanted to do repairs. Yes, the repairs can be done. It's the way they did it was wrong. So instead of coming forth and saying, we have a problem, this is the nature of the problem, not that we have a little crack, or we might have... Um, um, a, a cargo problem, it was, the problem was actually big, but, it, it, but the problem could be fixed. And what happened, that particular ship actually went to Mapuso, she was anchored in Mapuso for about two months, carrying out repairs. All right, so I'm just saying is that the approach was wrong, which is why I understand that they brought out the marine notice. Okay, we, you all know this, we have eight ports in South Africa. Um, I've, you, you'll go, oh, there are only seven, Michael. But it must remember that Port Elizabeth, there is Port Elizabeth and, and Cook as well. And we use all of these ports in order to bring ships in. Now, I always give credit where credit is due. So when it comes to uh, Transnet, the National Ports Authority, I used to moan and groan at them all the time saying, you don't let my ships come into your ports. Um, you chase me away. Um, and lately, I can on, hand on heart say, as much as I'm an advocate of SOSREP, Transnet have been absolutely fantastic with me. We have brought ships into Cape Town, Riches Bay, and Kucha. Uh, we did the APL Austria recently. You may have read about her. A big container ship, massive fire on board. Um, so hand on heart, um, TMPA have been really good to me. But as you know, they're owned by the South African government, and of course, they're a business. Um, and their business is just to make money into, into while um, keeping our, our economy moving. Um, of course, I, I've mentioned the ports, you've seen them. I'm speeding up because I know, yeah, and you want to see, and you want to see pretty pictures. Um, so, of course, transit control and manage all our ports, that goes without saying, make sure the ports are safe, provide good security, et cetera, et cetera. Recently, we had a meeting regarding the stowaways, and it rose up earlier um, about the number of stowaways getting on in South African ports. But I always say the stowaways start at the border, then starts at the port, and then comes to the ship. I always tell ship owners the other way around. We're responsible for our ships. Okay. Okay, so the National, um, National Ports Act deals with ports, how the ports are governed in terms of legislation, who's responsible for controlling the ports, the anchorages, etc. I often get a phone call from Justin Adams saying, Michael, one of your ships has left another anchor at the anchorage. That's Justin's job to make sure that anything that's left behind, uh, PIL, uh, anything that's left behind, we try and recover. Okay, not, no, it's not very easy. Sometimes, for example, if a ship's in 50 meters of water, you can't send a, a, a diver down 50 meters of water to look for something in the mud. It just doesn't work. But we make a very good effort to recover them. Okay, so let's deal with the requirements of a refuge. I will speak quickly. Okay, so before a ship can come into our waters, our office, we get in touch with SAMHSA, and we have to get their approval first. Um, and we tell SAMHSA roughly where we would aim to take the ship. So recently we had the entails, she had a main engine room fire, the plan being is put out the fire, uh, tell SAMHSA this is what's happened, we're going to bring the ship closer to the coastline, and once she's inside the port or when she's outside, we remove all the black oils 
And then I go and speak to the, the port captain in Cape Town and ask for permission to bring the ship into port. And he'll say, yes, Michael, that's fine, because that's where they've been lately. How long are you going to keep it here for? And of course, then we need to get her on our way as soon as possible thereafter. Um, so when it comes to all of these things, the first thing Samsa says, Michael, don't worry about the object. Let's start with the most important thing, and of course, and that's saving human life. So that's the start point. The first thing we do is we save human life. If there's been a fire or the ship is maybe sinking, we remove the non-essential crew members immediately from the ship. So if we have to save anybody, the less souls we have to save, the better. Okay, and all of that is done through MRCC in Cape Town. Okay, the next question, of course, is the environment, is the black oils. Um, on the Kiani Sasi, for example, um, the ship, uh, it was a major storm, the ship lost power, and she came on to a beach near um, uh, Neisna, uh, close to the uh, Gokama River, is that how you pronounce it, Gokama? But she's in the middle of a marine protected area. In South Africa, we have a number of marine protected areas, and ships like going, when they've been naughty and something goes wrong, they always pick a nice place to go. Generally, it's often the time it's, un it's inaccessible, because I love helicopters, um, but often there's like, it's in difficult places. The one for the, the, on the Kiani Satu, there was a lot of river crossings, you had to put cars onto barges, you had to haul them over rivers, amazing. I'd say I got the greatest job. You notice when the one that was up on Sheffield Beach, you know, remember the ship up in Sheffield Beach? She's name we don't, we don't recall. I remember going up to have a look at her. I thought, Yo, you know, let me go and see, I'm inquisitive. And I got there and I thought, ooh, take this jacket off, it says money on the back. <laughs> yeah? So I went down there to have a look and it was an incredible job how um, Smiths were able to refloat that ship. Unfortunately, they didn't sink her where I wanted to sink her, but be that as may. I'm a bit of a scuba diver. Okay, so moving on, we look at um, requirements for refuge. Okay, and these are the places where um, we want to put ships. Again, it's all dealt with through SAMHSA. I'm going to skim through this bit um, and speak quickly because you'll, you'll, you'll get the slides. But basically, it boils down to utmost good faith. We tell SAMHSA the truth, and they allow us to bring the ships in and be able to anchor her in a particular place where we want to put her. Okay, we provide SAMHSA with a whole lot of valuable information. Uh, things that obviously will make sense to you, bunkers being fueled, etc. where the ship is coming from, what has she been doing, where is she meant to be going, how long is she going to be here, etc., etc. and how, always the big question, how long will she be here and when is she going to go, and she wants to go as soon as possible, okay? Um, of course, if the vessel's structure has been compromised, for example, like on the Stella, on the Stella Unicorn, um, she had a, a, a major crack. Thankfully, it wasn't a crack into a cargo space, it was into a void space. We were able to bring the ship in, but that's valuable information. So what structural changes has done to the ship? Because that allows SAMHSA to work out a risk assessment, saying, what are the likelihood of Michael's ship really causing our shit here today? All right. The requirements of refuge, again, this is the point that I've ma I mentioned earlier, um, is when we bring the ship in, or shouldn't we bring the ship in? I had an argument with Samster the other day, and they said, Michael, the ship's not safe, and you must go 15 nautical miles off the coast. And I said, if she's that unsafe, why are you sending her 15 nautical miles off the coast? It's outside of helicopter range to get the crew members off if she's in trouble. Okay, so then negotiate with Samsa. Okay, she can come 30 nautical miles in. Okay, so it's one of those things that we can carry out a proper assessment. Generally what we do, since I love helicopters of course, I jump into a helicopter with the SAMHSA surveyor and we go in and do an inspection of the ship so they can reconcile what I'm saying to them is actually true and valid. Um, I always, if it's a Greek owner, I always check beforehand, double check before the SAMHSA surveyor arrives. So I can measure the size of the crack compared to the size of their crack. It comes out, <laughs> it comes out a bit wrong, but you know what I mean. Okay, Okay. so we've been using uh, um, PE a lot, especially with fully uh, loaded deep draft vessels, um, Saldana Bay, etc. And generally it's the size. You know, Richards Bay is a big port, you can use Richards Bay, but as, you, as agents will tell you, Richards Bay is busy. The likelihood of getting a ship into Richards Bay, she's in trouble, it ha would have to be an, a, a, a severe emergency. And they will help. I had a ship that was in trouble, not major trouble, uh, the front fell off, 
It wasn't made of paper, plastic, or other those original, but the actual front of the ship fell off, and we, didn't, we, we brought it into Richards Bay and put a new front back on. Okay? Um, going back to SOS rep, of course, is my point is, is that TMPA, if they can say no, if we had a SOS rep, he wouldn't say no. All of you may remember the MSC ship that was intentionally beached in the UK. That decision was made by the English SOS rep. The general public would have said, what the hell is this guy doing? But if you looked at it, that was the best decision possibly to make. They parked the ship on the beach and they were able to deal with the problem. I often sometimes say to somebody, if we have a major oil tanker, at, for example, at the SBM, and she's discharging oil and she's got a, develops a crack, what do we do to the ship? Do we send her 100 nautical miles out to sea and hope she sinks? Yeah. Or do we just you know, deal with an oil spillage on our, on our beachfront? So we have black oil all the way from the SBM to Mishlanga, kill the holiday season. Or we say to ourselves, let's bring the ship into port, let's put her alongside, let's boom her, and let's fix the problem inside a port. And of course, that's the answer. Okay? But then you've got to persuade somebody within TMPA of this decision you're going to make. Now, uh, lately it has worked. We haven't had a, bulk, um, a tanker with a crack, but you know, th logically it makes sense to bring the ship into port. If you have... Okay, it's been a very quiet winter, as you can see. My ribs are showing, Savanta. Okay, so let's, let's, let's try and get to the, get to the pictures. Um, we've used False Bay on a, on a number of occasions. We had a, big, a nice ship there called the Cape Africa, and we'll, and we'll, we'll get onto it. There's a picture of the, of, of the ship. Um, she suffered a major um, structural damage. Um, you can't see it in that picture, but I will show you. Um, that was the hole. Okay, so what we did was the ship couldn't continue her voyage in that, co um, in that condition. So what we did was we brought her into False Bay. She lost the cargo, obviously, from that particular hold. This is after we started, we started a latching operation. So we brought another ship inside. She had offset cranes. So it's obviously cranes on one side of the ship that could reach over to the ship, take the cargo from the ship we were removing the cargo from, put her into the new ship, and we ran an operation around with two ships in order to lighten her, okay? At the same time, all the black oils were removed from the Cape Africa. You can see the ship with the offset cranes. Yeah. Perfectly safe, nothing went wrong. Um, and the operation at the end of the day was a great success. So this is South Africans, actually, what I always like to say in terms of Operation Pakisa, this is on one of the working groups, exploits our blue economy. This is South Africans doing what we can do. And I'm very proud of it, that we have the skills and, and, the, and the ability of people in this country to do things. So when they chase my ships away, like up to Maputo, I get cross and I have to write about it in, in, in Maritime Review without mentioning any names. Don't chase them away. This is employment for South African companies, South African ship repairers, South African agents, launch companies, everything else. Assess the risk. Can it be done? We have the skills in this country. Yeah? We have this incredible coastline. We have these opportunities. We must exploit them. And it's something I, 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 when I get a chance, I, it's my bit of my soapbox thing. But there was a tug, so she's on permanent standby in case something was to go wrong. All right? Okay, so you can look at the worst case scenarios of things that could go wrong, but these are the things we do so it doesn't go wrong. And again, I've mentioned to you, we remove the, um, the, uh, the black oils from the ship. We have a salvage tug uh, available on standby. In that particular case, it was the Smith and Mandler. Um, we have an operational plan, which some so prove they have a guarantee in place, and we report them <coughs> on a daily basis as to how the operation is progressing. Okay, both SAMHSA and TMPA like my letters from my clients, and they accept them, and we have a standard worded letter which we use. Um, in South Africa, we use the 57 convention. Does anybody know about limitation conventions and things? Basically, in South Africa, we've got that one. We use the SDO protocol, and we move on. The most important thing is uh, you cannot limit wreck removal in South Africa at the moment, and I'm not quite sure where we are with the Nairobi convention, but the MLA is coming up soon, and the information will be... I'm sure Shepson and Wiley will send you an update of where they're going. So if you look at our available resources, 
Um, we've got, at the moment, we are the first country to have ETVs, emergency towing vessels. We have a contract in Cape Town. The Smith & Mondo is based in Cape Town, um, and she operates along our coastline. Our system was so good, believe it or not, um, we've developed amazing things in the salvage industry in South Africa. ETVs, we're the first country to have them. Other countries followed us. Uh, Dyneema towing wire was made in South Africa. Um, you all know what Dyneema towing wire is. It's towing wire for a tug in a ship. It floats on the water. You can run it through the surf. An incredible, an incredible product. Um, the other thing which we developed uh, was the Dyneema cutting wire. Um, I don't know, some of you, if you go search on the internet, you Google, uh, I think it was called the Trukilla. Uh, it was a car carrier in the English Channel, and there's a video if you can actually see the diamond cutting wire, cutting the ship into actual sections and removing each section from the bottom of the seabed. Okay, and that wire was developed in South Africa and by South Africans. Um, you obviously, we've now got other salvage companies in the market. We've got Resolve, they're based down in Port Elizabeth. Uh, Arden Subtech based here in, in, in Durban. So we have the skills and we have the resources to be able to deal with things. We have incredible warehouses in Durban, um, um, pollution companies like Dryers and Spiltech have got great equipment. Um, we have fenders that we need. We are all geared, geared up to deal with this particular operation, so we mustn't send them away to Savantu. We must keep them here. So each port also has a range of harbor tugs. Um, um, my friends from PL will look away quickly. Um, this poor ship was the Sea Elegance. Um, she was loaded with a, a, a cargo on board, uh, started the Rugby World Cup, uh, explosion took place on board the ship. TMPA obviously were able to send their tugs out to assist and, and, and help uh, control the fire. Okay, available resources, tugs in Cape Town for the Sea Land Express. Okay, helicopters, um, they were practicing recently, anybody who was down on the beach on last weekend would have seen the, the South African Defense Force helicopter working with the National Sea Rescue Institute. They were doing training exercises of crew members overboard, rescuing crew members, etc. cetera. Um, unfortunately, we're limited on the number of um, commercial helicopters available. Um, um, when I went out on the Stella Unicorn, we went 70 nautical miles out to see an incredible helicopter. What I liked about the helicopter, um, not the, you know, the price was good, but at the back of the helicopter, they had two emergency doors where you could load four stretchers. I wrote an article not so long ago after the helicopter situation um, uh, ran into a bit of problems. But I thought if we had a fire on board a ship and you've got um, to, to remove crew members who have been badly burnt, maybe somebody's got 80% bad burns or 40, whatever the case may be, is loss of life really acceptable? You know, as a country like our own, when we have so much coastline, can we accept that? And the answer, of course, is not. So, um, as I said, these guys are open operation down in Cape Town. When I wanted to go out of Port Elizabeth, they were happy to bring the helicopter up to PE for me and to be able to go out to the ship. And as I said, the great thing, is got these beautiful four do the doors at the back. You could put, load four patients on board. And that's what I saw as a huge positive. Okay, moving on quickly, time. Okay, just look at, quickly looking at the Selly One. I've told you the circumstances of the Selly One. Um, she was entered in a well-known Russian PNI club called the Russian PNI Pool, and they no longer exist. Um, this was the man in his, in his um, uh, crocodile shoes. Um, she wasn't entered in an international group club. Uh, when I talk about international group of PNI clubs, we're talking about the major PNI clubs. They've been around for 150 years plus. These are the kind of people, if a ship had to hit the beach and the ship owner's H&M um, policy had lapsed, they would not walk away. They look at the bigger picture. And the bigger picture is they have 1,000 ships or members within their particular club. What if, if they turn their nose up at this member, what is the South African government going to say when one of their next memberships come along, blue chip member? Yeah? So th they look at the bigger picture, and the bigger picture is we, we, the ship would have been removed as a... IG group expense. But unfortunately, with the Selly One, um, she was left to ourselves as taxpayers. And that's what we need to avoid. And, the, and, and this is what we, you know, you always learn valuable lessons in life as you go along. Um, if, you may, if you do something and you do the same thing over and over again and expect a different result, you're stupid. But if you, if, if you, if you change your philosophy as you go along, you're obviously going to get to the right result. And the right result here was we sharpen up and how we approach casualties and the information which SAMHSA require from a particular ship owner if he's in problems. Um, this is what Tradewind said, and said it all. 
And of course, what happened on the silly one, as she was sitting there, eventually a fire broke out on board the ship, etc. And it got a bit messy. The point I want to make here is that we had to quickly go and sort this out in terms of the approach of the South African government and how they deal with PNI insurance. So we made the necessary changes in that we can now deal with, um, uh, with PNI clubs and the government rather than dealing with fixed premiums. And there are some very good fixed premium insurers out there. Um, British uh, Marine have been a fam, uh, firm client of Shepson & Wiley for many, many years. They've never ever reneged on a bill or, or, or a, a, a problem. Um, if, what, navigators are, 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 is a good example. Um, okay, this is the picture I was going to show you about. Um, hopefully they come in, I'll be very quick. Um, this, this is only up until 2012, and I haven't updated it. But these are all the collision, um, these are casualties. These are ships that have grounded or sunk on the South African coastline in, in that period of time. Yeah? Okay, that doesn't include my, my, the Kiani Satu. I haven't had time to update her. Uh, she is the one who came aground uh, on the, uh, at, in the Gokama Nature Reserve. Uh, in 2013, great job. We actually refloated the ship. Unfortunately, there was an oil spill. We cleaned up the beaches to the DEA satisfaction, uh, and no oil was left behind. The smart, everyone remembers the smart. I'm not going to go into much uh, talk about the smart it's subject of, of, of huge litigation. Okay, but if people will know is that she had 1,800 tons of fuel oil on board. I removed 1,800 tons of fuel oil without dropping one drop in the sea, okay? Um, and then, as you know, she became a very expensive wreck removal, but the wreck was removed uh, to the satisfaction of SAMHSA and signed off, okay? Um, the the Pepe um, Botteglieri, um, she had hot coal. She was coming along our coastline, um, hot coal on board, had a fire on board. Here's an example of Richards Bay accepting a ship as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, in, an emergency, okay? Uh, in Kura, I've used the port recently. People may remember the Merselandrina. Again, a ship loaded uh, allegedly with calcium hypochloride. The cargo was misdeclared. The cargo was dead below deck. There was an amount of explosion on board the ship, and all the cargo on board the ship was destroyed in that particular cargo hold, Okay? Um, the Prague Express, again, off, I uh, brought it into Kucha. Again, she had a collapsed stove of containers on board, um, and we were able to bring it into port. Again, I seem to be using Courier a lot lately. Talani's been very good to me. Everyone will now remember the recently the APL Austria, uh, a fire and cargo hold number four. Again, all the cargo was destroyed. What's quite funny is that when, you work, when, you, when you're part of the Bidvest group, they have a lot of... Um, People, they're obviously worried about their directors and health and safety and everything else. And uh, uh, Yanni Roof gave me a call and he was wanting to know whether his employees were fine. And um, I had the phone between my ear over here. And I, in order to, and I thought, let me put something down. So I put something in the back pocket. Actually, between my, between my leg, I had a, a fire hose. And one of the containers had flared up and I was actually putting out the fire going, yeah, no, no, um, your stevedals are all fine. Uh, uh, <laughs> nobody's in problem at the moment. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and you, yeah, well, let's hold on. Shh. I'll, I'll put the fire out. I'm one of those guys, I can't sit around and watch people work. Uh, I've got to get stuck in and I've, I've, I've got to get involved. Okay, the, I mentioned to you the entails. Again, engine room fire on board a ship. Uh, fire put out, black oils removed, brought into Cape Town. Uh, still a unicorn. I've, I've got a picture of her for you, but not of the crack, of course. Um, that seems so rude. Okay. Bigger ship I've been on. Yeah. Um, she was a converted um, ultra-large crude oil carrier uh, and made into a bulk carrier. Uh, unfortunately, her sister's ship sank, um, which is why she came off Cape Town. Uh, then he, uh, 425 meters. Uh, when I landed on board the ship, um, she was rolling. And now always when I land on board ships, I always I call it my exit strategy. I salvage masters who have dealt with me. And this particular one, it was, it was Richard Erasmus. And Richard says, uh, Mike, I know what you're thinking. What's the exit strategy? So I said, well, your job is to go and report on the, on the damage to the ship. He says, and your job, I'm going to the bridge to have coffee with the master. I said, uh, 
I'll leave you to go down below. And off those surveyors went, and I went up to the bridge, and I said, Captain, I'm going to turn your ship. And he said to me, uh, no, I've got a riding this way. The swell's coming, and I don't want to beam onto the ship. I said, Captain, she's turning 180 degrees, whether you like it or not. So very slowly, I, I got onto the helm. And I said, what the bloody hell is this lawyer doing? Don't worry, I don't sink ships. <laughs> not myself. Anyway, so I turned the ship around completely, 180 degrees. So we had the swell coming from the stern. And straight away, now the ship wasn't rolling as she was. The, the waves went pounding into where the potential crack was, and I knew the helicopter would be able to land safely now back on the deck to get me to Cape Town. <laughs> you see? It's called an exit strategy. And I hope I entertained you enough. <laughs>